Okay, today is April 25th, 2012. This is Children and Justice. This is our last class meeting. And we pretty much made it through confidentiality last week. And we're right up to where we should have been. So before we begin learning Module 8 and talk a little bit about the final examination, I want to wrap up a couple of concepts within confidentiality. You all remember that there are three sources of confidentiality in the law. Stuff, discussions, documentation, paperwork, files are not confidential unless they arise from one of these three sources. Somebody tell me one of the sources of confidentiality in American jurisprudence. What's one source of confidentiality? Excuse me? Discussion? No. There are three sources of confidentiality. There are, if somebody said to you, well, I'm not going to give you those records. I think they're confidential. And you said, well, I don't know. Maybe they are. I'll go look. Where would you look? What's one place, if you had access to this, and everybody does with the Internet these days, where would you go look if you were a child protection worker, worker for DIFUS, or you were a nurse working at the hospital? Uh, or you were a teacher uh, working in a, a school uh, where, and you had graduated from this program, where would you go look? A code of ethics book. A code of ethics book. So one, one source of confidentiality is what? Ethics. ethics. The ethics of your profession. Another source of confidentiality is? Statutory. That's just laws, man. Those are laws. Statutes is a synonym for laws. You go look it up. DIFUS records, records of the Division of Youth and Family Services in New Jersey, are confidential because we declared them so. When I say we, we wrote a law. The state of New Jersey has a law. It says DIFUS records are confidential. <coughs> and the last kind of confidentiality only arises in legal proceedings. Privileges. Privileges. Some people are privileged not to testify in court because of the relationship that is implicated through their testimony, whether it be husband or wife, doctor, patient, psychologist, patient, social worker, patient, victim, counselor, journalist, source, clergy, penitent, spiritual advisor, penitent. Those are privileges. So anyway, that's a little bit of a recap. Some of the things that I want to emphasize also is we did the dangerous client exception to confidentiality. That's Tarasov. That's Tatiana, who was butchered by the love sick man at UCLA some 40 years ago or so, when the Supreme Court of California ruled that in certain cases, psychologists and anyone who has confidential information may have a duty to warn about dangerous clients but it's just not any dangerous client. They have to conclude that the client poses what kind of danger? Credible, Credible danger, which means it's not a guy blown off steam or he's delusional and has no means or opportunity to do harm. What else? It has to be clear and present. The word that they typically use is imminent, but clear and present works for me too. That suggests imminent, so it has to be imminent. It has to be believable and meaningful and probable um, or credible. And it has to be serious, serious. We're not going to go warn somebody about some danger uh, that involves a slap in the head or a trip or uh, you know, egg in your car. We're not going to breach confidentiality because someone might throw some toilet paper in your tree on mischief night. Right? It's not serious enough. And lastly, it has to involve what kind of victim? An identifiable victim. Somebody we can warn. Right? What they refer to as a readily identifiable victim. Great job, guys. Great job. Awesome. Um, one of the other things that I'd like to emphasize about confidentiality is uh, what the law giveth to clients, what the law or ethics or statutes um, or administrative regulations 
give or provideth to a client, the client can waive. The client can give up that privilege of confidentiality, that protection. So in any case, in any case where confidentiality is involved, you can always get the person who the confidentiality protects to sign a piece of paper saying, I want my records given to the police. I want my records given to child protection. I want my medical records sent to the, you know, orthopedist in Montreal, Canada. Uh, I want you to do that. Uh, rest assured, all of us, when we want our records from a doctor or for some medi center or some uh, radiological associates or some sort of place, we sign some consent to share them with other people. Uh, that package of paperwork that they give you when you first become a patient includes many things, uh, and among them typically are waivers to share those patient records with other treating professionals. One thing I didn't mention was sometimes the court might order somebody to get a psychological exam. Let's say we are in family court and the question is fitness to parent. Who's the more fit parent or the more able parent in a child custody litigation? The court might say, okay, I want each parent to get psychologically evaluated by these independent clinicians, these psychologists, and I want a report. And I want that report to be shared with the attorneys and the wife slash mother, husband slash father, with the probation department. So in that case, on the front end, as you go into that process as a litigant in family court, or you might even be a criminal defendant in the criminal courts, when the court orders a psychological evaluation, for some purpose that helps them understand the case better, the implied waiver kicks in. In other words, your order, not so much a waiver, but there's an implied exception to confidentiality. The court can overrule confidentiality in certain instances. Now, when it does that, it does that in a very limited fashion. They didn't completely obliterate confidentiality, but among the court working group and among the parties to this litigation, those records will not be confidential. So the husband's attorney will read the wife's psych eval, and the husband will read the wife's psych eval. The wife's attorney and the wife will read the husband's psych eval. The judge will read the psych eval. Sometimes there are professionals or who are appointed who are appointed by the court to help the court out. Guardians and guardians ad litem, especially in the family court context, which I'm using as an example right now, they may get copies of these evaluations. So that is kind of inconsistent with the philosophy that we've been talking about in connection with confidentiality. That is, I'm going to sit down, lady, I'm going to tell you everything I feel, all my dreams, all my secret desires, everything I did in college and stuff I did last week, because I know you can't tell anybody. That's the deal. But there are exceptions. And in this situation, that stuff's going to be shared among the court group. Do you understand? So that's a kind of situation where there is implied consent, well, implied consent by the, by the parties. And by the way, rest assured, I'll tell you something that's going to be on the final exam that I just thought about. I went and did some extra research for you guys, and I posted an audio clip that describes the difference in New Jersey between a guardian and a guardian ad litem. Does some of you remember when I did that? And I posted it in the announcements, and I spent about 18 minutes babbling on about what the differences are. My recollection is one of them is like a court-appointed investigator who finds out information about all kinds of things and reports back to the court. And the other one represents the child. One, I remember, I think, has to be a lawyer, 
The other one doesn't necessarily have to be a lawyer. So my suggestion to you is, as with everything, when I go out of my way to do something, investigate or research something, I'm probably going to ask you about it, especially if I post it online and offer it to you. Um, and now I'm giving you even more of a head start on that kind of question because I'm telling you, I'm going to put an example, a question about that thing on the fine. Any questions about confidentiality? Very good. That wraps up Learning Module 7. We're going to move on to Learning Module 8. Learning Module 8 is about expert witnesses. Expert witnesses. Now, this is a nice transition because a moment ago, as an example of implied consent, I told you about a family court judge who's deciding what the best interests of a child are in custody litigation, ordering some psychological evaluations. Right? I just got done saying that moments ago. Well, that's an example of the court relying upon an expert to help understand the parents' personalities, their proclivities, their parenting abilities. Sometimes the court needs help in understanding issues that are relevant to the case that's being decided. So a parenting evaluation provided by an expert within the family court is something that is relatively common and important. It arises from an expert. Now, there are a variety of experts that might help the court do the right thing for the kid. One example I gave you is a psychological evaluation on fitness to parent, parenting evaluation. There are a variety of ways that experts assist the court. And in order to truly discern or understand the difference between an expert witness and a regular witness, let me tell you a little bit more formally about those two kinds of witnesses. Generally speaking, there are two types of people who walk into the family court or into the juvenile delinquency court or into the criminal courts. Lay witnesses and expert witnesses. Lay witnesses and expert witnesses. A lay witness is a person who saw something, heard something, smelled something, who was there at the time and place. Your typical witness, right? They're a witness to the crime. They're a witness to the parent yelling at the child and hitting him with a belt in the backyard. Maybe they're a neighbor who watched the child strapped to a chair one summer day in the 102 degree heat, and it's a neglect case or a physical abuse case. That neighbor who saw the child strapped to the chair in the backyard in the, in the heat of an August day would come in and say what they saw. Maybe they heard the kid moaning. They'd say what they heard. A witness who comes in to provide information about the case, about the facts, it's called a lay witness. L-A-Y. L-A-Y, a lay witness. We attorneys sometimes call them a fact witness. It's just easier. They know the facts. They're offering facts. And those facts that they offer arise from the use of their senses. Their eyes, their ears, their sense of smell, all that stuff. Sometimes there are things that the court needs help with or that the jury needs help with. Issues might arise in the case that need explanation, specialized explanation. And in those cases, you won't rely on a fact witness or a lay witness, you'll rely on an expert witness. And there are many examples of expert witnesses in the courts. Imagine a case where a child is killed in a Chevrolet Camaro, and the assertion by the parents who lost their child in that tragic car accident, where they allege that General Motors was negligent in the design of their anti-lock brakes. If the negligence 
lawsuit alleges that General Motors was faulty in the design and manufacture of anti-lock brakes. Well, if that's going to be litigated in the civil courts of Middlesex or Mercer or Passaic County or wherever, you can't expect a jury to understand how brakes are designed, what the difference is between anti-lock brakes and regular brakes, how the brakes did not function properly in this case where this child died. People don't know that stuff. We need to bring in engineers. We need to bring in people who understand stuff that are able to explain things that are beyond the understanding of the average juror. They assist the jury or the judge in understanding complicated issues that are beyond the understanding of the average person. But what they come in to talk about has to be relevant to the case. They just don't come in and talk about interesting topics to amuse the jury. They talk about stuff that's relevant to this case. And in the case I suggested, anti-lock brakes is central to whether General Motors is negligent in the design and manufacture of the Camaro brakes. And if they were, then arguably it contributed to the death of the child. And thus they may be entitled to money damages. Within the juvenile courts, sometimes juveniles commit offenses that are so serious that they deserve to be litigated in the adult courts. You did a discussion board about that kind of philosophy. Remember? We also talked about this process. Can someone tell me the formal name of the process that puts juveniles in the adult courts? Waiver. Very good. Who said that? Nice job. Waiver. For the record? Tamara, right? I got you. We are being taped. Tamara said a waiver, and that's right. The, jur the jurisdiction is waived from juvenile court to adult court. Now, we'll really test your abilities here. In nearly every case, there's an expert witness. And that expert witness comes in to explain to the judge, usually a psychologist, whether this kid can reach something whether something can happen in the future that might make it likely he stays in juvenile court. Does someone remember one of, one of the factors that have to be proven to go from juvenile court to adult court? The prosecutor has to show that the juvenile cannot be something by the time they're a certain age. Rehabilitated by the time they're... Does someone remember the age? Right in the middle. 19. At least that's what it used to be. I, I think it's 19. So the way that judges decide that issue is often through not only their understanding of all the facts and circumstances in the juvenile's prior record, but also with the assistance of an expert witness. Typically the juvenile will hire an expert, a psychologist, who would come in and explain that if this kid, given a chance, with the services of the family court, they can be rehabilitated by the time <coughs> they're 19. You know, that's something the court needs help with. They're not psychologists. They don't know this kid. They can't apply risk assessment as well as a clinician who studies this and practices this and works with kids all the time. Within the criminal courts, prosecutors and defense lawyers rely on experts all the time. All the time. Imagine a case involving the possession of child pornography. I'm participating in a 
group at Seton Hall Law School to evaluate the child pornography statute and to make a decision about whether it ought to be changed and made more clear. And we're looking at that entire child pornography statute and we're examining whether some of the words need to be changed or whether there's um, an additional theory of liability that ought to be added to the criminal code. But one thing we prosecutors agreed on, it's very hard to prove these cases involving what we call peer-to-peer, peer-to-peer file sharing. And many of the child pornography prosecutions in New Jersey and around the country involve peer-to-peer child pornography exchange, trading, and possession. Now, most of you, if not all of you, have no idea what peer-to-peer means. And jurors are in the same position. So an expert would come in and explain what peer-to-peer is and why that's important and how that is meaningful with regard to whether this defendant possessed the child pornography and whether he knowingly possessed the child pornography. You see, what's unusual about peer-to-peer is Many people simply use these peer-to-peer clients. They're just apps, like on your phone or your iPod or whatever. They call apps, which is short for applications. They're just computer applications. But there's an implicit agreement you make when you use them. When you use one, you can go get music, or you can get um, software, or you can get videos and movies and trade them. Now, the Motion Picture Association and the record industry and lots of copyright holders have a big problem up here to here because a substantial number of people use it to trade music with other people without buying it. In the late 90s, it started out with something that wasn't peer-to-peer, but similar, called Napster. It was Napster clients on every computer in Montclair State. I had never heard of it. I went to use a computer in a computer lab, and you know, I saw an icon, Napster, and I had read about it a little bit in the paper, and I didn't really know what it was about. And I saw lots of students sitting in front of computers just hanging out as music flowed through the pipes onto their computer. But Napster was driven out of business because the lawsuits and the threat of lawsuits. But, you know, the principal, Sean Fanning, uh, Sean Parker and Fanning's dad, I forget his name, they became millionaires eventually. <laughs> Sean Parker then hooked up with, what's the kid from Facebook's name? Zuckerberg. 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 Parker hooked up with Zuckerberg and, and was involved in the early days of Facebook as well. But that was different. These kids, they had sexual server computers in their dorm room that all the music was on. Now it comes peer-to-peer. Now peer-to-peer is LimeWire and Kazaa. Kazaa's out of business. LimeWire may even be out of business. There's 50 other flavors. But what happens is, is when you go online and sign up for one of these things, you look for music, and there it is. You look for movies, and there they are. So you go get them. But when you go on and use the app, all your computer's hard drive is exposed for people all over the planet. That's the deal. By turning it on, you're sharing your stuff with the whole planet, and everybody on this network of three or four million people at any moment in time has their computers shared as well. That's how it works. Well, I have the Bob Dylan album, you have the new Madonna, you know, you have the uh, latest Beyonce. You know, nobody says this, but I see a Beyonce on his computer. He sees the Madonna on my computer. Oh, 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 oh. So everybody's feeding at the same trial. Well, that's not right. Absolutely feeding at the same trout. Everybody is sharing everything they got with everybody else in the world. Back to child porn. What does that have to do with possession of child porn and, and distribution? Distribution is up to 10 years in prison, maybe 20. You can't pinpoint where it comes from. Well, forget about whether the guy is liable in that sense. If you sign up for one of these things, and the idea is you share the stuff on your computer with the other dude so you can go get whatever you want 
from the million other people that are using this at any one moment in time. Most guys and gals, mostly men, go on there just to get free stuff. They may not even realize that they're opening their computer to be plucked. Once you do that, it's not a fourth degree crime, but up to a year and a half in jail at the county. It's up to 20 years in state prison. So the difference between simply going and finding child porn, which is disgusting and despicable enough, but it's a fourth degree crime, it's not as serious. The difference between that and distributing it or trading it is significant. So you have these guys who, oh, I just want, you know, they just put this stuff on because they want to go get stuff for free. Some of them weren't even interested in child porn. They were interested in movies and music and porn and, you know, crazy stuff, car accidents, trains running over people. Just, they have a deviant, you know, interest in stuff. And then they go to child porn. Many of them are into child porn. Some of them are molesters. But the point is, many of them simply sign up to go pick free fruit from the tree, not realizing that their stuff is in play. You understand what I'm saying? You go click on this. Oh, yeah, I want that. It's free. Put it on your computer. Like, oh, look at this. The latest Madonna album. Free. Whoop. I'll take it. Oh, I'll take this. Ching, ching, ching. All the stuff is flying into your computer. At the same time, if you look closely, in your music folder and your video folder, stuff's flying out of your computer. Guess what? You're distributing whatever's on your computer. Once you're done, and if it's a child porn guy, once he's done downloading that child porn, that file that's on his computer is getting sent to China. It's getting sent to Africa. It's getting sent to Antarctica, wherever people are. So these kind of file sharing programs, which many people use simply to get stuff, makes them a distributor at the same time. And a lot of guys flip out when they get charged because they're like, I wasn't doing that. Well, yes, you were. Despite all that, does the jury know what the hell I'm talking about? Do you know what the hell I'm talking about? Do I know what the hell I'm talking about? I don't know. I'm a little closer than you, I imagine, in understanding, unless you messed around with Kazam back in the day. The point is, an expert in file sharing and peer-to-peer -peer networking would come in and tell this to the jury. You'd have to do that. Because they're going to sympathize with the defendant. They're going to say, wait a minute, man, I use the web. And a lot of times I get junk in my box I didn't ask for, and I don't know how it works, and the guy seems legit. Well, we may need to have an expert, and we will need to have an expert come in and explain to the jury specialized stuff that's relevant to the case. That's beyond the understanding of the average person. Is it fair to say that peer-to-peer -peer file sharing is beyond the understanding of the average person? I think so. And is it relevant to the guy who's sitting there who's charged with possession of child porn? Sure is. So an expert will come in. When a pediatrician comes in and explains about a fracture in the courtroom, whether it be in the family court or whether it be in the criminal courts. That would be expert testimony. Because pediatricians have specialized knowledge. Right? The typical way this happens in child maltreatment is, suppose a baby, a baby who is three and a half months old, presents to the hospital, excuse me, with three fractured ribs and a fractured clavicle. And the caregiver, the father will say, says, oh, I was carrying her in the living room and she slipped out of my hands and fell on the floor. Well, the pediatrician would size that child up, right? They would evaluate the child, they would look at the radiological film, the x-rays, and they would conclude that the the story, or the what they call the history provided by the caregiver, is inconsistent with medical science. In my opinion, the injury was not caused by a fall from about four and a half feet onto a carpeted floor. And often the next question for an expert is, 
what makes you say that? What's the basis for your opinion? Well, in order for a child to have a fractured rib, you'd have to have more compression. And, and based upon the fact that it was a shag or, or deep pile carpet, it's highly unlikely there was enough force to cause the fractures on the rib. But more importantly, in my diagnosis, the clavicle is a very difficult bone to fracture. We very rarely see clavicle fractures unless they're abusive in small children who are non-ambulatory. Non-ambulatory means they don't move around, they crawl, they don't walk, jog, or run. It's real hard. The clavicle is this bone right here. It ain't easy to, even on that, me, it's hard to break this bone. It's a very rarely fractured bone, this bone here. And in a baby, how do you fracture a baby's clavicle? How? You punch it, or you hit it, or you stomp it, or you throw it. That's how you do it. Go ahead. The clavicle? Yeah, no. in child abuse. Oh, in child abuse. I have to see what you read, but. Among child abuse fractures, the word common might be indicative of it's almost always child abuse. Look, I'm not saying, look, a giant jug could fall off a, a shelf and fall right on a kid's clavicle. I mean, anything's possible in, in time and space. Um, but it is pretty hard to fracture the clavicle. Uh, but look, it up, look for what you said. That's not a common injury among people or children. Oh, it's making noise and bobbing. It shuts up. I think it's the camera that's moving. Oh, that thing's moving. It's recording Harry. <laughs> well, I don't, if the camera might still move, I don't know that that's related to the TV there. Is it still doing it? I got you. I think it's like trying to move or something. It's fine. All right, well, let me shut it if I can. I don't know. Uh, I'll just stay here. Maybe it's trying to follow me or something. Is it moving now? Something? Is it doing something? Okay. So a pediatrician would come in as an expert witness and give their opinion, their medical opinion, within a reasonable degree of medical probability is usually how they say it. And there are a variety of contexts. I'll give you another bone. Uh, the thigh bone, what's called a femur, in a nine-month-old, ten-month-old, you know, it's, it's hard to fracture that bone to begin with, but if there's what's known as a spiral fracture, which comes from twisting, and that's a common and raised parent move, where you grab the leg and twist it, it creates a very specific kind of fracture called a spiral fracture, where there are the opposing forces, the twisting motion, creates a peculiar look on an x-ray. And it just doesn't happen in normal development or in a normal household. It just doesn't happen. Now, could it happen if a kid gets his leg caught in a hole or falls out of a crib and their leg gets caught between two slats and they twist? We've heard those kinds of histories provided over the years, and they could cause a spiral fracture. But if the parent says, I, you know, we had a parent who says, oh, I showered with the kid, which you're not supposed to do. But let's assume in that culture or that lady thought that this was a good idea, kill two birds with one stone, whatever. She showers with the baby, washes her up, one in one arm, and I drop the baby in the shower. Spiral fracture? I don't think so. Okay? Not on a fall. Okay? So when an expert comes in, a pediatrician, and explains what a spiral fracture is and why their opinion and diagnosis is that this injury was not accidental, that would be an expert witness. That would be an expert witness. Now, experts come in basically two varieties. Experts who give opinions, like I just explained to you. The doctor's opinion was it's not accidental. It was, it was applied force. Somebody did something to this child. It's not accidental. 
So they may come in and give their opinion about something. In drug cases, sometimes seasoned detectives come in and they give their opinion about somebody who possessed a quantity of drugs. And their opinion is, I believe, within a reasonable degree of investigative certainty, that this defendant possessed the drugs with the intent to distribute. Now, I don't believe, I'm not even sure today you can do this, talk about this defendant, but they usually talk in terms of hypotheticals. But if the prosecutor or the deputy attorney general says, if a guy has 200 glassines of heroin, a glassine's a little manila envelope, which small amounts of powders are stored in, cocaine, heroin, typically. Well, an expert would come in and say, in my opinion, the person who had 200 of these possessed it to sell. What's the reason for that opinion? And then they explain why. You know, if you wanted to an ounce of heroin, you'd buy it in a bulk. You know, it's like going to Costco. You know, you're not going to go to Costco if you want, you know, a lot of ketchup because you've got six kids. You're not going to buy 400 individual packages. Now, there's always an answer to the defense, like, well, I put them in their lunches or whatever. Well, tell us what you were doing with the glassines. I like to keep a few in my pocket when I'm walking around town, in case I got the urge to start some heroin. Nobody does that. It's cost ineffective. But whatever the credibility of that opinion, seasoned narcotics detectives come in and give an opinion. Those are opinions, right? The doctor's opinion is this injury is not accidental. The cop's opinion is this, this drug in this packaging was possessed with the intent to share or distribute. That's one kind of expert witness. The other kind comes in and simply educates the jury about an issue that's in the case. We call that a lecture expert. And the difference is the cop that I was talking about with the glassines, he's talking about this case. In this case, there's 20 glassines. In this case, my opinion is that the guy possessed it to sell or distribute or share. The doctor that comes in and talks about the fractured femur or the fractured clavicle, they come in and give their opinion about this case. This baby, it's my opinion, suffered non-accidental injury. The lecture witness simply comes in and doesn't know anything about the case. They give the jury information that helps them make a decision. I'll give you a good example. If you are prosecuting a domestic violence case where, where the batterer is a man and the battering began, the violence by the man against the woman began when they were dating. And just before they got married, he beat her so bad she was hospitalized. Yet six weeks later, Six weeks later, he, she married him. They move in together. They have a child. He assaults her periodically, and then he beats her almost to the point of death. She lies in the hospital room, eventually comes clean to a social worker. The man is charged. She goes, and she asks that the charges get dropped. And they do. She resumes living with him. And then he beats her again, and she goes to the police, and then there's a prosecution. Now the jury's going to say to himself, what kind of person who was beaten to near death would go back with the same guy? People flee danger. People get away from violence. People's innate way of dealing with life is to avoid pain and suffering. How could this be? It makes no sense. I don't believe her. Or, I don't believe it was as bad as she said. Oh, it could be as bad as she said. We would put an expert on the stand to explain what? Battered woman syndrome. Why women who are in a relationship and get battered and assaulted would return to an intimate partner. And there are a bunch of reasons. But they wouldn't talk about this lady, they just talk about battered women syndrome. This is the way women who are in a battering situation, who are in a 
domestic violence situation might react. It doesn't mean they're nuts. It doesn't mean they're liars. It doesn't mean they're overstating it. Some women do that for all of these reasons. I don't know about this case. I didn't look at this case, the expert would say. They wouldn't say that, but that would be the what's happening. The expert comes in to give a lecture. So you have opinion testimony and lecture testimony. Opinion and lecture. One last example before I show you some concrete examples of expert witnesses. Still within child advocacy and child protection. Very often, when kids are sexually abused, an expert will come in and explain how likely it is that penetration occurred and whether penetration of a child would leave any residual or any trauma or any lasting injury. The assumption by many is that a doctor can tell that a doctor can tell whether a child or an adult, for that matter, was penetrated. And that is a faulty assumption. In fact, my interview with Dr. Martin Finkel, as you recall, emphasized that. I talked to him in the beginning, the first five minutes, about the landmark article called It's Normal to be Normal. Jurors don't know that. Your average person doesn't know that. You didn't know that a couple years ago. I didn't know that before I joined the prosecutor's office. I thought, like everybody else, that the doctor could tell. I thought that there was something called virginity, which makes me bristle when I see in Pakistan and, and in other countries, uh, it's, a, it's alleged that there are virginity tests. How do you do that, man? I'm not sure how that works. If you listen to Dr. DeVellis or any experienced expert on rape and sexual assault and women's anatomy, you will find out that, you know, in the sense that there's a physiological change to a woman's body that denotes whether they had sexual intercourse, it's not true. It's not true. Virginity is a social construct, not a clinical one. It has no meaning in the law. It has no meaning in science. No such thing. Now, if you're using it to say, well, a person who had sex once is not a virgin, if that's the definition of virginity, well, that whatever you want, that's what you want it to be, it is. If you're, if, if, not, if you're not a virgin, if you had sex three times, then you count. And I'm two times, one more time, I'm not a virgin. It, that's just a definition that we can make up and change. But to the extent that there's a physiological, there's a bodily meaning to virginity, not true. In the world of child maltreatment, the related expectation is, is that you can tell if a child has been digitally or object or penile penetrated. And the answer is no, you can't. You can't tell. For a variety of reasons that I'll let you see Dr. DeBellis explain in the video, where she's testifying as an expert, to let the jury know that just because this kid said her father put his finger in her vagina and she went to the doctor and there's no evidence of it, there's no trauma, her vagina looks fine and normal, that doesn't mean it didn't happen. So that's kind of an odd way to use expert testimony, right? You know, with the pediatrician, we're going, I looked at the ribs and they were fractured. I looked at the clavicle and it was broken. And I concluded X. There's an affirmative thing I looked at and I can show you. Here, there's nothing. We're explaining why there's the absence of evidence. And that's legitimate because there is an expectation by most people, including judges, that there should be evidence. And there's no reason why a bad guy should go free because the jury don't understand. So we bring in an expert to explain things that the average juror doesn't understand. That's what I started out by telling you about expert witnesses and it has equal application in the case of pediatric expert testimony about a genital trauma 
of female children. Doctors will come in and talk about that. Similarly, a psychologist might come in. By the way, if a pediatrician does see trauma, well, then they can testify about that. Say, well, my opinion, the trauma, the injury that I saw on the vagina of the child is consistent with some sort of penetrating event. They don't come in and say he did it, or it was a penis. They don't know. They just know there was some intrusion that could cause that injury, because it's not normal. Psychologists come in and talk about other things in child maltreatment cases, usually sexual abuse. And did we do the child sexual abuse accommodation syndrome in this class, or is that a forensic interview? I think that's a forensic interview. But there's a, there was an article written in 1983 that described the psychological dynamics of child victims in incest cases or intrafamilial cases, in cases where the kid is molested repeatedly by their dad, their stepdad, their uncle, uh, you know, their cousin, someone in the house, someone in the family. It could even be extended to their coach, their pastor, someone that they're subordinate to. And it's called the child sexual abuse accommodation syndrome. And like the battered woman syndrome that Tamara mentioned before, this is used to explain to the jury something that's what's called counterintuitive. Counterintuitive simply means different from what people expect. So people expect that when kids are molested, they might tell their mom, you know? Or if they're afraid to tell their mom, at least they would tell a teacher. And why don't they go back again and again? Why wouldn't they lock their door? And if it happened, why would they only tell a little bit about it? And not tell the whole story? And why would they take it back and say it didn't happen? If they came in and said their father molested them, and a week later said, I made it all up, that should be the end of the case. Shouldn't it? That's the way the average person might think. But that's not the fact of the matter. The fact of the matter is, is that most kids, nearly all of them, who are involved in incestuous molestation, exhibit some of the things that Dr. Summit observed and offered to the other psychologists as a way to understand how to treat kids. Jurors don't know that kids who recant may have been abused and may be saying it for reasons that have nothing to do with whether it really happened. We ought to be able to explain that to jurors. And you can't. You can put an expert on who can explain to the jury, not about this case and this kid, but generally how kids experience intrafamilial sexual abuse. So they would be lecture with a lecture expert witness versus an opinion expert witness. Got it? Got lecture versus opinion? They don't give an opinion about this kid. They would go, I don't know this kid. He asked me. I don't know this case. I don't even know anybody's name. I'm just here to be a professor and give a lecture about how the typical kid responds to child abuse in the house. And that's relevant to this kid who was molested in the house. The lawyer would argue at the end. So the jury's in a better position to evaluate this kid's case by understanding the research in this area. And they almost, in a professorial way, give the research. Sometimes people are not prosecuted criminally because they had a mental disease or mental infirmity that causes their behavior to be excused. <laughs> Some people are not guilty by reason of insanity. 
The good news is you're not guilty. The bad news is you're going to go to a mental hospital. And when you get better, then we'll put you in jail. So to people who think, you know, oh, insanity, these guys are bums, they, they're getting over on the system, and they're not. Oh, they're faking it. Some guys fake it, but many don't. And they, they belong in a hospital. They belong treated. Well, whether that person belongs in a hospital, whether that person ought to be treated, whether that person knew what they were doing at the time of the crime, is the subject of expert testimony. And I will show you an expert witness talking about his diagnosis in a case involving insanity in a moment. So again, those are things that the jury or the judge doesn't know a lot about. You need a special person to come in and give expert testimony. Let's take a look. Let me get this computer fired up. What happened here? This is, an this is an example of a lay witness. This young woman interviewed the child in the case. And while she's a professional, she ain't an expert. She's coming in to say what happened the day she interviewed the child. She happens to be a child interview specialist. Next witness, please. Yes, Judge, thank you. State calls Fran Raguso, please. Fran Raguso. Good morning, Mr. Rugusa. Good morning. 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 Mr. Russo, by whom are you employed? By the State County Prosecutor's Office, the Special yeah. Victims Unit. And in what capacity are you so employed? I perform all for uh, forensic investigative interviews of children that have alleged physical and sexual abuse under the age of 12. And uh, for how long have you been uh, so employed? I have been there since November 27, 2001. Okay. Tell us a little bit about your position, please. Um, basically, what I what I do is I'm housed at the Child Advocacy Center, which is a residential home in Patterson. Um, whenever we get referrals or complaints that come into our unit, uh, if the child is under the age of 12, I will assist the detective in conducting that interview of that child. Mr. Russo, uh, were you so employed uh, in this manner at the time of Tuesday, uh, October the 8th, 2002? Yes, I was. Okay. Calling your attention to that date, uh, do you recall becoming involved in an investigation that uh, surrounded an allegation of child sexual abuse with an alleged victim by the name of Destiny Ruiz? Yes, I did. And could you please uh, tell us how you became involved in this investigation? Um, I had received a referral that day approximately about 10 o'clock in the morning from a Jacqueline Ventura Douglas caseworker who stated that she had... Objection, Your Honor. Without telling us what she was... Alright, so let's just stay in Jack. Let's hear you. Just don't tell us what someone else told you in that regard. Go ahead. Okay, I had received a referral that day regarding a child by the name of Destiny Ruiz regarding a sexual abuse allegation. Okay, and based upon this referral, what if anything happened? Uh, my sergeant at the time, Frank Feenan, assist me, assigned me to assist Detective Steve Beatty in conducting the interview of Destiny Ruiz. Okay, and uh, tell us how this came about. Um, what happened is, is that while I was working at the Child Advocacy Center, Detective Steve Beatty um, had arranged for Destiny Ruiz and her mother, Elizabeth, to come to the center. And by the center, you mean the Child Advocacy Center? Yes. Tell us a little bit about the Child Advocacy Center, my 
Uh, the Child Advocacy Center is set up for children that are under the age of 12, and it's basically a residential home. When you walk into the first floor, there's a waiting area with a TV and toys for the kids to play, uh, couches, little tables, things like that. It's separated by a door, still on the first floor. There's two private offices in the back, along with the bathroom. Uh, those are both separated by doors. Um, if you walk upstairs, there's an interview room, which is um, to the right, and that room basically just has an easel and a chest that has anatomical dolls in it, if I do use those. Um, and then in the room next to it holds all our technical equipment, the video equipment, and whoever for that day will be monitoring the technical equipment. And our uh, all interviews of children under the age of 12 that allege this kind of abuse conducted here? Yes. And, and why is this so? They're all conducted up there in that interview <coughs> That's where um, all my interviews are being taped and recorded. And uh, why have the interview uh, at the Child Advocacy Center as opposed to someplace else at the police station? We feel at like the Child Advocacy Center it's less intimidating, less traumatic for a child uh, to walk into a house which is child friendly than walking to a detective bureau. Now, on that day, on October the 8th, 2002, you just told us how uh, Detective Beatty had arranged for you to be placed there. Uh, tell us what happened. Um, tell us the, the first steps you took in this uh, situation. Um, Destiny and her mother Elizabeth showed up at the Child Advocacy Center. I um, briefly introduced myself to the mother and the child, letting them know who I am and what I would be doing that day. Then I escort Elizabeth Bedrigal back to my private office, and um, I conduct then an intake statement. Okay, now this witness, is she giving her opinion about anything? No. Is she teaching the jury about research or about child abuse dynamics or about some esoteric subject that needs explaining? No. She's talking about what happened the day the interview occurred and what she said and what the people did and where it happened. She's a fact witness. That's a lay witness, L-A-Y. Okay? Now you're going to contrast that with the expert witnesses. This is what I was talking about earlier with regard to the witness testifying about the absence of findings in a genital examination. Starting as any 
Jim Carrey, Lee Bollocks, and you can tell us who had to tell. I'd go back a little bit, and I'd like you to tell us about um, the general examination. Just tell us how this began. The general examination um, involves the use of a machine we call a coposcope. This is an instrument that allows me to see closely uh, into the genitalia without having to actually go into the genitalia. It is a device that does not touch uh, destiny, did not touch destiny, but shine a light on her private parts through the image, um, the, the image of the private parts are projected onto a TV screen or a computer monitor so that destiny could see what she looks like as well as see what I'm doing and that it could decrease anxiety. Okay. How did this uh, specific area, utilizing the pulse scope, how did this specific area begin? What was the first area that you examined? The first area that I examined is the uh, external genitalia. Is um, there a name for that area? Uh, we call that the labia majora and minora, or the lips of the genitalia. Okay. And uh, what were your findings as to this area? There were no indications of trauma uh, to this area. What was the, uh, the next area that was examined? The next area involves uh, separation of the labia and looking into what we call the lower space at the hymen and general vaginal wall tissues. What was the, your finding as to this area? Um, this area was the more well known indication of trauma. My conclusion was that the examination results did neither confirm nor deny the possibility of sexual abuse. Tell us why you arrived at this conclusion. This conclusion was actually based on two major factors. Uh, one has to deal with the architecture of female genitalia, and the other has to do with um, the healing of injury, both within the time frame as well as the types of injuries one would expect in this scenario. Tell us about the first uh, aspect, the architecture of the vagina. The architecture of the of the genitalia, because the vagina is part of the genitalia, um, is actually, if one were to consider an analogy, um, it's very much like a house. Um, I know that when I was growing up, my mother uh, told me that uh, your hymen was a closed piece of tissue that would break open and bleed when you had sexual intercourse or any degree of penetration. And um, that she could take me to the doctor, and, and basically the doctor could tell her that um, I engaged in uh, sexual activity. Is this an accurate assessment? No, in fact, it's quite the opposite. Um, literature, research, medicine has uh, said quite the opposite in terms of female genitalia. And again, the architecture is very much like a house. If you can envision yourself walking up to the front doors of the house, and let's say that house, that house door has two doors, so you can open the two doors of that house. You walk into a foyer, or what you could call an antechamber, a foyer. Beyond the foyer, you may see a living room. And between the foyer and the living room, there's an open doorway, let's say with a wood frame around the doorway. That blue line is very much like the architecture of female genitalia, where the lips of the vagina are the doors of the house where the foyer of the house is what we call the vulvar space, part of the vulvar tissues. The hymen in this analogy is the wood frame that's around the doorway. The hymen is actually a very, it's an open piece of tissue. It's supposed to be opened. Um, the living room is what we call the vagina. That architecture really speaks to a number of uh, spaces, if you will, within the genitalia, part of where penetration can happen into the foyer of the house, not the living room, and result in no injury to the hymen. So the emphasis on what the hymen looks like is really one that's erroneous. And the emphasis shouldn't be placed there because penetration into the genitalia can happen without injury to those tissues. How so? Penetration can happen directly, uh, sort of perpendicular right into the genitalia, or can happen in a way that is in the vulvar space, similar to the way a hot dog would sit in a bun. You would envision a penis, a finger, an object being placed um, in the labia, between the labia, into the vulvar space, into the foyer of the house. Um, that type of mechanism 
or I should say orientation and penetration, uh, is one that's not expected to result in injury. The second aspect that you described is pertaining to healing. Tell us about that. These types of injuries don't heal with a scar. Um, in fact, I, I like to communicate the analogy of uh, getting an injury inside the mouth, which is, from a tissue perspective, very similar to a tissue that's in your genitalia, female genitalia. If you were to, let's say, bite the inside of your mouth, you could get a cut or a bruise to that area. Generally, those um, injuries heal quickly. And if you were looking in your mouth into the mirror, you probably would not find a scar. It's very similar to the injuries that we see in the genitalia. Bruises, abrasions are going to heal very quickly and do not result in scar formation. Other types of injuries, like deep lacerations, um, heal via different mechanisms. The body heals deep lacerations differently because they involve many layers of tissue, many layers of cells. Those types of injuries heal via a scar and would result in a deformity of the genitalia of the tissues that I could see years later. So there's an example of a pediatrician testifying about the absence of medical evidence in a penetration case. And you no, know, she explained that in her opinion, that's what's implied here, in her opinion, the absence of medical evidence in this case, she evaluated this kid destiny. The absence of medical evidence does not mean that it didn't happen the way she did, the way she said it did. So she would be testifying um, as an expert in a manner that educates the jury and the judge through her opinion, as well as providing information. With an opinion witness, you get both. You get a lecture and an opinion. With a lecture expert, you get simply the lecture with no opinion. Here's an example of two. An opinion expert again, and then a lecture dissertation witness. The first witness is testifying about someone who's been institutionalized because they were not guilty by reason of insanity. And he's giving the diagnosis. You'll hear him use terms like axis this and schizophrenia. And it's his opinion that this person belongs in the mental health facility, lockdown, for the reasonably foreseeable future, and that any other less restrictive environment would not be okay. He needs to be locked down. That's his opinion. After that, you hear two sides of the child sexual abuse accommodation syndrome an expert for the government, for the state. I'm sorry, I think I only give you here a lecture testimony by the defense where he explains why the syndrome is not persuasive. But he doesn't give an opinion.
this is the expert for the state, and then we see the expert for the defense in a lecture type testimony about the syndrome, which I mentioned earlier. Baker, B-A-K-E-R. Thank you, Dr. Baker. Um, you bring that with you, or if you have a report or anything, you know, do you have any other documents you might be referring to? No. Okay, come on. Just follow us up to the line. Just watch us up here, Dr. Baker. Dr. Baker, do you want to set the floor? First, I want to talk a little bit about your background, experience, and education, okay? You are a Ph.D.? and a licensed psychologist in the state of New Jersey? Where did you obtain your Ph.D.? And when did you get your Ph.D.? In 1990. And in what discipline? In child and uh, clinical psychology. Okay. Do um, you have a New Jersey certification? That's a New Jersey certification. What disciplines? As a teacher and a you uh, have a master's degree as well? I do. In what discipline? School of Psychology. <laughs> and you have a Bachelor of Arts degree? I do. In what discipline? In Spanish and in Education. All right. You received your Bachelor of Arts in Spanish in 1976? That's correct. And um, your master's degree was at Seton Hall University in <laughs> That's correct. And uh, your PhD, I don't know if you said this, was that at Seton Hall as well? Yes. All right. Now, before an expert is allowed to be an expert witness, the judge, whether it be in civil court or family court in a juvenile waiver hearing or in matrimonial court in a custody litigation, they have to be convinced that the person is an expert, that they have the requisite or the required education and experience. Now, you don't have to be a superstar, although Dr. Baker that I'm offering as an expert in this video happens to be highly experienced, but you can be an expert simply because you know a little bit more than the jury about peer-to-peer -peer networks or how short text messages work on a cell phone or how antilock brakes work. You don't have to be a superstar expert. You simply need to have more experience and understanding of a sophisticated subject than the average person. So you noticed in all of these clips, or most of them, the person is talking about their training and background so that the judge accepts them as an expert. And the jury has a basis to evaluate the weight of their testimony. If the jury's impressed with their education and experience, then they may be more likely to adopt or embrace what their opinion is. Her point, uh, the second was helplessness. <laughs> and I just want to kind of underscore the fact that the, the power differentiation, or the power differential between an adult and a child um, really relates to the authority that, you know, an adult has over the child. And I think it's similar to what I just said, that if you're an adult in um, uh, an authoritative position over the child, it generally happens within a family. Uh, as does the school or the daycare situation, you have authority over that child. The child really isn't in a position to exert control or to say no to someone who's in authority. Again, it reflects the helplessness and childhood. Okay, and perhaps this is a good transition. Um, let's move on to entrapment uh, and accommodation. Exactly. There's secrecy surrounding the abuse and the fact that uh, sexual abuse occurs in isolation with no one else around. Uh, given the, all the other kinds of secrets that then develop out of uh, not being able to tell anyone, and given that children are vulnerable. Uh, they're helpless, and they feel that there's nothing they can do because of the state and because uh, they can't say no uh, to uh, an adult authority. We're not even talking about the possibility of being kids or physically needed. In fact, they quote unquote don't go along. But given their secrecy, given their helplessness, 
kids easily figure out that there's nothing else they can do. They can't run, they can't hide. What they do is to do what normal, healthy children do, and that is find ways to cope. They find ways to, and that's what accommodation is. If in fact they feel trapped, there's nothing they can do. They find a way to, for what they're thinking is, is to keep the family intact. So if you remember in terms of secrecy, if in fact the secret is you know, uh, revealed, horrible things are going to happen. Uh, oftentimes directly, offending parents will say, you'll have to go to foster care, or mom will fall apart, or um, you know, horrible things will happen. No one will believe you, you know, think you started it, and you know you wore that certain dress on a certain time, we wouldn't touch you if you didn't look this way, etc. So kids internalize it partially it's their fault. And there's no one they can tell. They feel bad about keeping the secret, but they haven't told it, so no one's going to believe them. So they truly, truly feel trapped. So they find all kinds of things. Children are very resilient, they're very creative. They find all kinds of ways to make it feel better inside. And they do that by what we call accommodation, which is a way that they figure out how to go on with life and keep the family from falling apart. Because if they're a good person, they won't tell them keep it inside and keep things going as, as uh, they should go in a family situation. They do that in a variety of ways, the accommodation. Certain predictions, and if you do research and show that those predictions are borne out, then that gives some weight and support to the theory. The problem with the theory of child sexual abuse and foundation syndrome is that if a child says they were sexually abused and then repeats that consistently, whether it's in the same interview or in subsequent interviews, then we take that as evidence that the child sexual abuse occurred. But if you'll notice, the last of the five stages was called retraction. So if the child says, no, I make it all up, or you know, somebody told me to say it, or something of that nature, the people who believe in child sexual abuse as a combination syndrome go, ah, that's the first stage, that's retraction. Therefore, it means that it occurs. That it occurred. So, whichever happens, whether the child says it did happen and says that repeatedly, or the child takes it back, the theory predicts that that confirms child sexual abuse. You can't have a theory where contradictory information like that fits into the theory either way, becomes an untestable theory. So that expert at the end for the defense was simply giving a lecture about child sexual abuse accommodation syndrome. And while he was giving an opinion about the theory, he wasn't giving an opinion about this case. So he was summing up the belief among some psychologists that the syndrome is not good behavioral science. Excuse me. Dr. Baker, the woman who testified before him, was testifying that it was good science and what it all means. And both of them were giving a lecture or information to the jury. They were not giving an opinion about the case. At the beginning of that video clip, you had a forensic psychiatrist. You didn't see the man who was insane but he came to court to explain that he was still insane and what the diagnosis was and that he still belongs in lockdown in Ann Klein Forensic Psychiatric Hospital. He gave an opinion about the guy who was sitting there that you couldn't see. My opinion is this guy is still mentally impaired and he's still dangerous and he needs a, he called it a structured environment. He continued to need a, he continued to need a structured environment which means lockdown at the forensic hospital for the criminally insane. And that was his opinion. He's another form of expert. Now, in the world of child advocacy, there are other kinds of experts that are relied upon in the family courts, in the criminal courts, and in the civil courts. And what you need to be mindful of 
is that sometimes the court or a litigant might hire an expert to evaluate a child or evaluate a parent. I talked about this earlier. Now that would be a forensic evaluation. Examples Professor Myers talks about are court-ordered evaluations by a mental health professional determine, to determine whether a person charged with a crime is competent to stand trial, like we just saw. The insanity defense, like we just saw. Capacity to make a will. Parenting. You have to be very careful when I say you. Forensic clinicians, therapists, and psychologists have to be very careful when they agree to become an expert. It is frowned upon, it is strongly discouraged for someone who is a treating therapist to then be the expert witness. I'll give you an example. Uh, Dr. Eskelin, who's a colleague of mine and a brilliant clinician who taught at this university, and you may even hear some of her podcasts in this program. Dr. Eskelin, in the notorious Glen Ridge gang rape case in the 1990s, evaluated the victim. Now, many of you may not remember this case, but in affluent Essex County, suburb Glen Ridge, New Jersey, a group of sports, uh, a group of athletes at the high school lured a developmentally disabled girl who went to the same school but was on a different track at Glen Ridge High into their basement where they took turns raping her um, with things, little baseball bats and other objects and and they also raped her uh, conventionally, or conventionally with their, with their body. Dr. Susan Eskelin evaluated that child, as well as was her treating physician, or she's not a physician, her treating therapist. So Dr. Eskelin was treating the victim, and then also testified for the prosecution that she was unable to appreciate the nature and consequences of human sexuality. Therefore, she was a protected kid. She was part of a protected class. The prosecution wasn't about her being young. They were age mates. She was 16. So it wasn't that the boys, she might have even been younger, but they weren't much older, so it's not a crime. Remember, there's that four-year difference that's required. So a 15-year-old could have sex with a 17-year-old. It's not a crime. The theory of the state's case was that these boys knew she was limited, that she had a mental impairment, and they exploited her. And she was a protected class. She was so impaired that she couldn't consent to sex, like a little child can't consent. Someone who's mentally impaired may not have the ability to give meaningful consent. Dr. Esplin not only treated her, pardon me, but also gave her expert opinion about this child's capacity to give meaningful consent. And while it wasn't an ethical violation, although the defense argued it was, it created some very tense cross-examination. And it creates a very difficult posture for a witness. Because remember, your first loyalty is to your client. So it certainly raises the question about whether your opinion, whether your conclusions about this child's status as a victim were influenced by your desire to get her better, to treat her well. Your loyalty to the client or loyalty to the truth? 
So it was strongly suggested by the defense, and that's putting it mildly, aggressively suggested by the defense, that her opinion should be ignored, discarded, that it was fundamentally flawed because her loyalty to the patient skewed her ability to be objective in the criminal prosecution. That is, she was biased in behalf of the kid, thus more likely to say the kid was limited when an objective person who sat with the kid would say, well, she's slow, but she can still understand what's going on. And she made the decisions that you and I wouldn't make, but they were informed decisions. It would be very hard for somebody who's the doctor and spent 16 weeks in a row building rapport and helping this kid and trying to treat her to be fair and objective in the courts. So Professor Myers points out, and it's important to appreciate in child advocacy that treating therapists should avoid what are called dual relationships. If you're going to do a forensic evaluation, then that ought to be it. You shouldn't treat the client. It's not per se banned by the American Psychological Association and other governing bodies but it's strongly discouraged. And I discourage it, and I wouldn't recommend it. So, Professor, you're saying not only separating the investigator or the evaluator from the treater, but also that the expert testimony regarding the technical um, should also be a separate person? like her ability to make decisions regarding her intellectual disability to maintain an uh, objective viewpoint. What I'm saying is that there are a variety of kinds of experts in courtroom litigation. There are where mental health is involved. There are going to be two kinds of people. Somebody who treats the patient and somebody who gives an opinion about the competence of the patient. And I think they should be two different people. The person who treats the patient is arguably biased in favor of that patient. Thus, their objectivity could be compromised when it comes to being objective about that person's competence. And if one finding or the other has a negative impact on the patient, then the professional is going to want to avoid that. For example, maybe Esplin's going to say, maybe Esplin really believes that the kid was able to give an informed decision, that she was able to consent. But she doesn't want to hurt her patient. She doesn't want to have the boys who did this get away with it. She's developed a rapport and loyalty with this kid. So her opinion about whether this kid was able to give informed consent may be affected by her personal feelings about the patient. Who needs that? Just have someone else do it. Why do we need this? As a prosecutor, I, I, it's a problem. I don't need this. I don't need three hours of cross-examination. And let me tell you, if I'm on the defense, I'll make it five hours. If I go into private practice and I see this, I'll bury the professional. Bury them. I don't know whether we'll win or lose, but we'll spend five hours and be skewering them. Because it's not healthy. And whether, look, Sue Eskel and I respect her a lot. And I don't think for one minute she changed her opinion in that case. But there are things that are beyond our control, right? We may not feel it, but there are things that happen subconsciously that we can never identify. It's just the way it is. Where if you don't have an investment in something, you can be fairer. If you got an investment in something, then you want to testify against your brother or your father or your mother or your husband. How can you be fair? You can't. You've got an investment. You love them. You care about them. You know them. 
You know, even if they did mess up, they didn't mean it. And this is the only time they ever messed up. And I'm not going to bury them. Why? Because you care about them. And that's not exactly the same as this relationship, but you build a rapport. You know, you have a, a, an ethical imperative to care for and help your client. And if you spent the past three years treating that person, and you're waltzing in to the trial and say, oh, this is my opinion about an element of the crime. Without that element, the guys go free. They didn't, by the way. They were all convicted and some pled guilty and they went up and down the appellate division of the Supreme Court. Their convictions were firm. Any other questions about that? Now, the last thing was chapter 8, and that's that involves the cross-examination of witnesses. And we're just full of nice segues today, because I talked about how vulnerable Dr. Esplin or people who assume dual roles are on cross-examination. I suggested that I would spend five hours attacking someone if I was a defense lawyer about that dual role. And that's what cross-examination is all about. Now, there's two types of testimony in the courts. The easy one is direct examination. You saw the first video clip I gave you of the lay witness. That was um, Francine Raguso, Jr. If females can be juniors, I don't know. But her mother's here. She teaches here. Same name. Anyway, Francine that was on the video was going through direct examination. The prosecutor, Professor Freed here, Chris, was examining her. That's the easy part, where the, your lawyer puts you on the stand and you are asked questions that you're prepared to answer. That's called direct examination. Direct. So in the world of courtroom testimony, there's two kinds of testimony. Direct and cross. Cross-examination is when the adversary's attorney questions a witness. So in a criminal case, it's the defense lawyer. In a matrimonial case, when the wife's lawyer questions the husband, or the husband's expert, or the husband's brother, or witnesses. The proponent of the witness, the person who put the witness on, does direct. And the other lawyer does cross. Now, what does cross-examination look like? Well, you know, the notion of some lawyer battering and tricking and being mean to a witness to the point where the witness either has an emotional breakdown or changes their story or admits they did it and I lied. This doesn't happen. It's very rare. Now, there are some very aggressive criminal defense lawyers, very obnoxious ones, but most of them aren't. They don't need to be. They all have their different personalities. And their role isn't to, although it would be great for them if they showed you were lying or nuts, that's not their ultimate goal. They're just trying to shake the jury's confidence in what you had to say. They're just, just trying to get the jury to be a little skeptical of what you have to say. And the way they do that with witnesses, especially lay witnesses, is through a variety of means. One is, is to look for inconsistent statements. So a defense lawyer will ask a witness, isn't it true that you told the grand jury that when you woke up in the morning, your daughter was laying on the carpet and you did not observe how she fell? I don't remember saying that. Well, maybe I ought to show you a transcript of what happened at the grand jury. Whatever. 
Sir, do you recall going in front of the grand jury? There's so many perils, right? So you, the advice I give everybody is just tell the damn truth. And if you made a mistake or you said something different, say yes. I'll explain why. We'll figure out why. We know you're not lying. Right? Embrace what they have to say if it's true. Don't play wise. Because they're pros and you're an amateur. So I'm suggesting that in my little mock cross here where a guy goes, ah, whatever. Whatever? Oh, you do remember testifying in front of the grand jury. Now you need to say yes, of course. Like I, say, I think, yeah, whatever. When was that? That's not an effective witness who's like, doesn't remember walking into a formal tribunal before 23 people and raising his right hand. How many people here have ever testified in front of a grand jury? Zero. So you think you might remember it. Anyway, so you need to say, yeah, of course I remember that. Well, I want to show you lines 15 through 38. Take a moment to read that. Does that refresh your memory about what happened? That you told the grand jury when you woke up the baby was lying on the carpet? Yes, I did say that in front of the grand jury. And today, in front of this jury, you said that you watched the baby fall off the changing table. Isn't that true? Yes, but stop there, sir. I didn't ask you to explain. I just asked you whether you told this jury that you awoke and watched the baby fall off the changing table. Did you not say that? Ten minutes ago. Yes or no? Yes. And before the grand jury last year, you said that you woke and she was already on the carpeting. Yes or no? That's true. End of issue. So inconsistency, saying something different in the past from what a witness said today in the courtroom, is a common and effective tool for cross-examination. The suggestion is that how can we have confidence in what they say if their story changes? And there are a lot of other ways to utilize this as a defense lawyer. Oh, now their story's changing. <coughs> because the prosecution has gotten a hold of them. And their prosecution is influencing their memory. And they're changing their story to fit the facts or to fit what's best for them. So there are a lot of things. Inconsistent statements are not good. They happen all the time in human nature. So most of the time you can explain that. But sometimes there's really big inconsistencies. Okay? And when they happen, the defense lawyers are going to highlight them and try to argue that you shouldn't be believed, or that you're being misled by your proponent, the prosecutor, or the plaintiff's attorney, and those kinds of things. I'm reminded of the article I read today in the Bergen Record, and I'll show it to you right now. Okay, Th this article I brought up on the computer from the Bergen Record was in this morning's newspaper. The man in the photograph is a man named um, Ken Ziza. 
He's the former police chief of Hackensack in Bergen County. He's also, I think, an assemblyman for a while and a, a part of a family that has strong uh, political connections in the state of New Jersey. He was indicted, to say, in Bergen County for a variety of things involving official misconduct, including an allegation that he appeared at the scene of his girlfriend's drunk driving stop in the middle of the night and intervened with his own police officers because he was the chief and got them to not give her a blood alcohol test and to let her go home with him. The witness that was on the stand over the past couple of days was a woman officer who testified that she was told by either the chief or men at his direction to change her police report and delete anything about the woman being drunk from the report. This article is interesting. The body, that black that you see to his left, the chief is looking a little bit to the left. That's Patty Prezioso, who's a former uh, assistant attorney general and a brilliant lawyer. She represents now in private practice the former police chief. And The article says, City Police Officer Laura Campos gave new details. Defense lawyers love jumping on new details. At the time of trial, all of a sudden, something's new? Officer Campos provided new details Tuesday of her role in the alleged cover-up of a 2004 assault involving the teenage sons of Police Chief Ken Ziza's former girlfriend. Okay, this is the other thing he's accused of, not the drunk driving. The same girlfriend's son was involved in a, some kind of assault and theft or robbery. Now, it's not like they robbed a 7-Eleven, but it was a robbery, I think. He was accused of getting in a fight and there was some injury. This is the police chief's girlfriend's son. So he's accused of intervening in that, too, so the kid didn't get charged or he got a, what they call a station house adjustment. He went home. He didn't go to jail, and he certainly didn't get indicted, and he certainly didn't get prosecuted. So that's the other act of misconduct that he did to help out his girlfriend, Police Chief Ziza, allegedly. In the third day of testimony, Campos, a key witness in the criminal trial of Ziza and Kathleen Tiernan, that's the girlfriend, said she remembered that her supervisor... Thomas Aletta handed her a slip of paper at the assault scene that contained details she was supposed to enter into the police report. Assistant Bergen County Prosecutor Daniel Cattell elicited the information in an attempt to explain alleged, here's the big word, nobody likes these inconsistencies, but defense lawyers like them, so when she was, this is redirect now. So after cross-examination, the prosecutor or the plaintiff's attorney gets to go again and clear things up. So while he's attempting to clear up what I have in blue, the inconsistencies, he points out through her testimony that she now remembers. See, last week she didn't know who told her to change the report. Now she remembers a man's name and he gave her a slip of paper. But defense attorney Patricia Prezioso, who is representing Ziza, accused Campos of making up the details during a four-day recess in the trial to make her story seem credible. Is there a reason that you're making facts up? Prezioso asked, then withdrew the question before it could be answered. So you see... This is the bread and butter of litigation. This is what defense lawyers use. They point out inconsistencies. They also point out details that were just quickly remembered. Things, an inconsistency is something that you should have said before that you didn't say, and you're saying now for the first time. Right? She didn't say the man wrote it 
sent me a text message that told me to leave it out, and now she's saying he handed me a slip of paper, that would be an inconsistency. But if she said in the past nothing about something, or didn't remember something, and now she does remember, that's arguably an inconsistency too. Oh, all of a sudden, now you remember? You got a slip of paper? And defense lawyers love this because they spend about 10 minutes and they, this is called the setup. There's a variety of them. Is it fair to say when you arrived at the scene you made certain observations? It's true, yes. And you wrote them down, yes. And the reason why you take notes at the scene of an event is so that you can prepare a report later, in part, yes. And also so you can remember what you observed and put that in a report, yes. And you understand that the reason you use notes is, is that sometimes people forget things, yes. And it's fair to say that at the time, you just saw these things, so they were fresh in your mind. Is that right? Yes. Um, it is three years later. It's fair to say that your memory is nowhere near as good as it was on the day you were standing there. Is that right? Well, if they go, well, it's pretty good. Oh, you're one of the special humans who remember stuff better three years later. Is that right? Are you? Are you special? And you know what? Juries, if you act like I just did, a lot of juries get turned off. But if there's a liar, they like it. If, you, if somebody's patently lying or really playing a game on the stand, I'm not so sure saying they like everything of it, just being obnoxious or being aggressive or being wise-ass. But many jurors conclude, you know what, they deserved it. That's why I just tell the truth, man. So I tell them, just say what happened. No matter what you say, I'll be able to fix. And if we can't fix it, that's the way it goes. But don't leave us high and dry by lying. Or a lot of people don't lie, but they try to finesse and get wise. Well, I don't know, and, and be clever. Don't be clever, man. This is not the place to be clever. This is the place to be humble. This is the place to be just like those 14 people you don't know. You're inexperienced, you're an amateur. Just say what you remember, and if you forget, say I forget. So you want to show inconsistencies. They may look for bias. Bias is having an interest in the outcome. Dr. Eskelin was arguably biased because she had an interest in the outcome because the kid was her patient. You might have an investment. If you were testifying on behalf of Apple Computer and you invested in Apple Computer, you know, you may have a bias towards Apple Computer because you want to make money from their stock. A mother has a bias towards her son, right? If you're friends with a witness or a litigant, you may have a bias towards them. So bias is the subject of cross-examination. Isn't it a fact, sir, that you went to high school and college with a defendant? That's right. Well, it shows that they're friends. So friends want to help friends. Convictions of crimes, certain crimes, and in New Jersey all crimes that are felonies may be admissible to show that a person who violates the norms of society and commits crimes may not be the most credible witness. Jurors sometimes believe people that are criminals. I put many criminals on the witness stand. Some of my best witnesses have been criminals. In part because they listen to what I say, number one, but more importantly, because they understand they are better witnesses than regular witnesses. Because they've been there. They understand the system. They've been in the witness chair. They can handle themselves well. When they tell the truth, in my experience, there's no better witness than a criminal. Because usually they're fascinatingly articulate. Sometimes in an intellectual way, sometimes in a crude way, but often articulate. They know how to tell their story in a courtroom. And when they tell the truth, they're ready for anything the defense might throw at them because they've been there, done that. The worst is the criminal who lies. They'll be demolished within minutes by an experienced defense lawyer. Anyway, convictions of crimes are 
fair game for cross-examination. Obviously, a witness who has some mental health issue, a person who has an intellectual disability, or somebody who has been you know, institutionalized or had mental health problems, that may be admissible to show that they are not competent or that they are not good at observing and remembering. You know, your power to observe is the subject of cross-examination. If you're an eyeball, eyeball witness, excuse me, you got bad eyesight, they're going to bring that up. If you got bad hearing, they're going to bring that up. Your powers of perception are always in play. Why? Because you're coming in and asserting something that you saw, that you smelled, that you heard, that you remembered. And if your brain don't work as well as the rest of us, maybe your memory ain't that good. And if your memory ain't that good, we're relying upon it to put that guy in jail, to take that baby away from that mom. And you don't have a good memory. We need to know that. I'm going to expose that on cross-examination. Powers of perception are impaired. Fair game. Fair game on cross-examination. Related, cross involves how far away you are, whether it was light or dark, whether you can see well, whether you can hear well, whether your view was obstructed. All of these things are offered by the defense to minimize the impact of a witness's testimony against their client. Whether you had an adequate opportunity to observe events, if you only watched what happened on the street corner for a millisecond, that's different than somebody who watched it the whole time. Any questions about cross-examination? Nothing? Hey, Tamara? Yes. Yeah, I'm going to review a little bit for the exam now, so you ought to listen to this audio cast at your convenience, okay? I know you got to make the bus, okay? Okay. All right. Well, we talked today about medical evidence, right? And about whether it's found in cases and about... You know, Dr. Dr. Finkel's podcast. We know all about the frequency of medical evidence. You obviously should pay attention to that. Way early in this section of the semester, I told you that the focus in child abuse investigations by defense attorney changed from attacking the kid to attacking who or what. What's that? Very good, the interview, or interviewer, absolutely. So that's something that we talked about early in the class. Um, I told you just a little while ago that the child sexual abuse accommodation syndrome is not a diagnosis. That witness who comes in doesn't testify that this kid was abused. They're what kind of expert witness? An opinion or a lecture? They're a lecture witness. The expert comes in that doesn't know anything about the kid. They don't know anything about the case. In order to know, be an opinion witness, you need to know about the kid in the case. So the child sexual abuse accommodation witness, accommodation syndrome witness, is a lecture witness. They're not allowed to give an opinion about whether this kid was abused. Primarily because that syndrome is not diagnostic. It doesn't prove anything. It just tells you how some kids respond to child sexual abuse when it happens in the family. So you don't suffer from child sexual abuse. It's not a diagnosis. But some kids don't tell right away. 
And some kids, even though they're being molested, they still go in daddy's room. They get used to it. They accommodate. They deal with it. And some kids say that it never happened. They take it all back, recant. Doesn't mean that they're lying. Okay? Child sexual abuse accommodation helps explain kids who get molested in the house or family or by a trusted other. It helps explain their behavior. It's not a diagnosis. We talked about hearsay. We talked about the many exceptions to the hearsay rule, right? Dying declaration, excited utterance. We did confidentiality. We've talked about Dr. Finkel's podcast. We spent a lot of time at the end of class, maybe two weeks ago, looking at the pros and cons of video recording kids under the age of 12. Remember? I would focus on that. I'm going over reviewing the exam with you right now. Any interview with a kid under 12, right, on video, it's typically sexual abuse because we have that hearsay exception. Okay, Look, there's a whole chapter on the pros and cons. You, I talked about it. You read it. Read it again. Familiarize yourself. It's called the pros and cons of videotaping kids' statements. Okay. It's in Myers. No, no, no. You, no, no. Yeah, I, I didn't talk about the pros and cons of medical exams in children. I'm talking about the pros and cons. Remember, it freezes the kid in time. You can see what they look like now. Three years later, they're a lot older. It's a more comfortable environment. The, there are many pros and there are many cons. Some of the cons were uh, the, compute, the machine could break and you lose it. Uh, you have to store the stuff. It highlights just one little aspect of the kid's statement and kids tell in a process on multiple occasions. Yeah, that's the thing. Try to remember, review that. Um, we talked about the syndrome multiple times. We, part of the syndrome is when kids take things back. They call that recantation. Uh, we talked about a lot about confidentiality. Remember I told you a subpoena is a fancy document, but it's you can object to the subpoena. Okay. But if that subpoena is valid, then you gotta turn over the confidential information. If it's valid, a subpoena requires you to turn over confidential information. Sometimes the defendant's constitutional right requires that confidential information be turned over. Let's say a guy is accused of child molesting and the kid told her therapist that she made it up. The guy is being prosecuted. You think the therapist is going to win by saying, well, that's confidential, I can't tell you what she told me. The guy is going to go to jail for 50 years. The, the Sixth Amendment and the Fourteenth Amendment, Amendment of the Constitution trump confidentiality. They override confidentiality when a defendant's liberty is at stake. So the court will order that those records be provided to the defendant so he can defend himself. When we talked about kids in memory, you remember that. We talked about the fact that kids can remember stuff pretty good. You know, it, it gets encoded. I threw that word around a lot, encoded. The problem is it's difficult to retrieve. They may have the memory, but they can't say it. They don't have the words or experience. Or they don't even know what the hell happened. They don't really understand the dynamics of what they experienced. So they don't have the tools to tell what happened.
mentioned to you about prior inconsistent statements before. If you look at Professor Meyer's book, Inconsistent Statements, when lawyers do that, they call that impeachment. It's a fancy word for telling the world that they made a different statement in the past about it, something. When you confront somebody with an inconsistent statement, they call that impeachment. Fancy word. One of the interesting things about lay witnesses and experts is, although not all experts give opinions, remember there are lecture experts and opinion experts, and as I said, most opinion experts are lecture and opinion, and then you got other experts that are simply lecture, and they just give a professor-like babble to the jury. Some experts give lecture and opinion. You saw many examples. Lay witnesses, you and I, we don't give opinions. <laughs> All right? You know, in my opinion, he was going to punch her in the head. Nobody asked you your opinion, and you're not allowed. Lay witnesses, generally speaking, can't give opinions. Go ahead. I was just going to ask you if you have a sense of um, if there's like a, a weight of how much of the second part of the semester versus the yeah, the focus is on the second part, but there may be things from the first part. Okay. So I will focus on part two. But some nugget from part one might involve the difference between, I don't know, trial courts and appellate courts. You remember trial courts, they hear the witnesses. Appellate courts, they read transcripts. The easy way, easiest way to remember about appellate courts is, or courts of appeals, they never see humans, other than lawyers. They just read transcripts of what people said in the past. They never hear testimony. You read State versus Snell about mandatory reporting. We talked about the dual role of therapist that that's strongly discouraged. I talked a little bit about forensic interviewing, and I explained to you that although leading and suggestive questions are discouraged, with the real little kids, seven and younger, sometimes you got to ask mildly suggestive questions. Because if you simply say to a seven-year-old, tell me everything that happened, you're not going to get very much. So you need to ask very direct questions, sometimes. But when you say, well, tell me what happened when Poppy called you in the room. And they say, well, he took me on the bed. Tell me everything about that. When you ask a direct question, you should follow up with an open question. Okay, but it is okay, in fact, necessary for forensic interviewers to ask mildly leading questions from time to time of small kids. We talked about different kinds of memory. Free recall and recognition memory were the two big ones. Free recall is when you're asked to remember everything that happened on the drive to the classroom today. Recognition memory is Tell me everything that happened when the guy threw the rock that went through the window of College Hall. That I'm giving you information that helps prompt your memory. Free recall is the most sophisticated kind. It's the most complex. It requires you to use all your brain power to remember. Free recall. There's an article called Confidentiality Issues in Practice with Children, Ethics Risk Management. It's in Learning Module 7. I would, I would read that again or look at whatever you highlighted when you read it. Learning Module 7, 
update on confidentiality issues in practice with children. The author is Reamer, R-E-A-M-E-R. Yes. We looked at some video clips on excited utterance. Those are more of the examples of hearsay exceptions. Um, we talked about Tarasoff. What's Tarasoff versus the Board of Regents of the University of California at Los Angeles? Tarasoff. Tatiana. The duty to warn about dangerous litigants, I mean dangerous clients. Talked about it twice today and the other day. You have an article about HIPAA. I talked about HIPAA. That's confidentiality. And it's not as powerful as people suggest. There are certain exceptions. Certainly cops have a right to confidential information when they're doing a law enforcement investigation. There are a number of exceptions to HIPAA. Nevertheless, it does protect most people. It protects you and me from having our health records shared with people. One of the things on memory that Professor Meyer talked about was stress. And there's not a consensus yet on whether stress enhances or diminishes memory. The research is inconclusive. Some research suggests that when you're in an intense situation, you remember stuff better. Some of the research says that it degrades memory because you're so stressed out that you may not encode stuff as well. I would focus on Professor Meyer's descriptions of memory types. I talked generally a moment ago about recognition memory and free recall. I would look at all of his memory types. What I didn't talk to you about was investigative interrogations or interviews of suspects. Now, it is on the video, the narrated PowerPoint that I told you to watch about investigations of child maltreatment. But I'll refresh your memory. When you have a suspect that you're interrogating about child sexual abuse, despite the millions of television shows that suggest the contrary, the last thing you want to do is start yelling at somebody or getting in their face. I mean, you know, very often you see these shows that go, look at the picture, look at her, you killed her, and then you raped her, sodomized her, didn't you? That's the worst way to get a confession. All that's going to do is force somebody to cross their arms and ask for a lawyer and turn their back. You don't want to call them a scum, you want to tell them we understand. People make lots of mistakes. It's not your fault. Kids these days are very wild. My God, the things they watch on the internet and on TV. Girls want it. It's not your fault. You're not a bad guy. The guys who rape and kill kids are bad guys. All you did was sleep with your daughter. It's okay. All you need is a doctor to help you. That's the way to get people to confide in you, in part. So don't think by yelling and call them a scum going to work. That's the, the recipe for the opposite outcome. Okay? Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Any questions about anything in the in the course? Or any other questions? Go ahead. Anyway, it was a pleasure being with you uh, this semester. I really enjoyed my time with you. I think I have to, 
create one more thing, you got it hand in, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. What is that? Learning module four? Yeah. Learning yeah. project four, rather? Yeah. yeah. Um, and I'll, I'll do that. What does that do? Okay. And what is that? I don't remember. About what? Oh, about the child section of these accommodations. Okay. Well, anyway, good luck with that, and I'll, we'll see you in class next week. The likelihood is, I'd like to let you do it on a computer. I'm going to make it available. If you can all find a computer, it's easier to do. It's easier for me, and it's easier for you just to click. Mine doesn't let me log in. Well, you can go sit somewhere else. No, but my username doesn't let me log in. No matter where you are? I tried this one. If you follow those directions, I, I had it fail a million times until I followed those exact directions. Enter your net ID and password. Yeah, I've tried that a million times. Yours doesn't work either. But on any computer, no. Go ahead. Will you be posting the answers to this crossword? Yeah, yeah, we'll go over that. I'll uh, maybe I'll put something online. I wanted to do that today. Is that but go ahead. Oh, is it? Yeah. I have to give, they sent another email out. I said it last week. Next week's reading week. I don't think it's a class week, right? I don't think so on the calendar. No. Do the class is ending on May 1st. Yeah, the way this class works, that ends, that's Tuesday. Right. We're a Wednesday class, so class is over. Wednesday till next Wednesday is your reading period. So your exam is in two weeks. So there's no reason you shouldn't all get 25s. You got two weeks to study. All right. Good luck. Thank you. You're welcome. I'll see you here then. Anyway, right? Yeah. Hey, listen. Those of you who can't log on repeatedly, as just described a moment ago, email me so I call IT and make them figure out what the problem is. And they may say user error, but let them let them tell me that first. I don't know why. You guys know what you're doing. Who told me that a minute ago? Yeah, you log on at home, right? It works on my iPad. I just can't get on. I need this computer. Yeah, it works on your iPad. Works at home, wherever, right? Okay. But I want everyone who can't get on repeatedly to email me. Oh, I'm sorry. Here. That's okay. Thank you very much.